What it means is we're all going to get what's coming to us. You look it up in the dictionary, I don't know if that's what it'll say or not, but, but that's what it's all about. Except for the fact, thank God, some of us won't get what's coming to us. Some of us will receive the grace of God that he's planned for us to receive and paid for us to receive through the gift of his son, Jesus Christ. I, like God, want everybody to have that. But we will all stand before God as individuals on that day. Nations, I believe, are judged in the here and now. When you read through the Old Testament, you see how God brought judgment on nations. So in this world, I believe nations are judged. But individuals, you and me, will be judged when we stand before the Lord our God on that final day. Good morning. Yes, good to see you. I hope it's good for you to see me. I don't want to go too far with that, but we are, we are talking about godly individualism today. And I know that in certain contexts, that might sound like a contradiction to talk about godly individualism because we're, we're taught in the scriptures to be completely dependent upon God. But we understand that being dependent on God, we have a responsibility as an individual to make choices that are good. We go back to the third chapter of Genesis, and I don't know how many times I've started sermons here in the first three chapters or so, but in, in Genesis chapter three, we read about Eve being tempted. It says in Genesis chapter three, verse one, the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Now think about the serpent and think about what God would say to the serpent. If you've read this, hopefully you have, you're familiar with it. Part of the serpent's punishment, and the serpent is the devil, by the way. Uh, Revelation chapter 12 and verse 9 refers to the serpent, the devil, that old dragon, which is what people called serpents long ago that were large. They called them dragons. Apparently he started out with legs because part of his punishment would be that he would go on the on his belly and eat the dust of the earth. And that's coming later in chapter 3. We won't get down to that part. We don't need to. But I just wanted you to get a picture in your mind. Not as a serpent without legs as we know it. But I think a serpent with legs. And I don't know about you. When, when I go to the zoo or I, I see a, a snake in some other context. There's something that's fascinating to us about snakes. Even if we're scared to death of snakes. There's just something about snakes. Whoa, it's a snake. Uh... What that is, I don't know. Maybe this is part of it. But at any rate, here's Eve. She's talking to the devil. And he has come to her in the form of a serpent. And he says to her, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. God knows, the serpent continues, that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate." The eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. Everything was great until the serpent came along. What did the serpent have? He had new information. It was false, but it was new. And we know there's, there's some excitement that's generated with things that are new. It seems like all the time there's something new coming down the pike, something new, something we've not experienced before, and because it's new and we've not experienced it, you need this. But when it comes to the truth of God, I would encourage you to beware of anything that's new. Did Eve know the truth? Sure, she knew the truth. And God even inspired Moses when he wrote down this record to write out how she had rehearsed the truth for the serpent, almost word for word, what the instructions were. You can eat from any tree in the garden, just not the one that's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And when we eat that tree, she knew, God has told us we'll die. And of course the devil says, no, you won't die. And that's what the devil's been doing ever since 
this happened 6,000 years ago. He's been telling us, you do what you want. You do what you think is best. You won't die. That's the new information that's really old information. It's the same old lie that the devil fed her that he's feeding us. And people all over the world are believing all kinds of lies because they are not thinking as godly individuals. We live in a, a media-saturated age, do we not? And that's not necessarily bad. Information is good as long as it's good information. Now, there's a profound statement. You can take that to the bank. Just write that down. And Marty Kessler said, information's good as long as it's good information. Duh, we know that's true. How many of you are on Facebook? Anybody? I, I talk to more people about spiritual things on Facebook than, than probably any other venue. And I think more people, uh, perhaps even than I, I make contact with on a Sunday morning. I, I don't know. But I know a lot of times when I have Facebook conversations with people, they will write out things that are totally inaccurate, and it's just clearly obvious that they haven't really researched this. They've just got some information they've heard from somebody else, and it's something that they like because this information allows them to say no to God, to say no to the Bible, to say no to morality. And so they put that information down there. And if you're familiar at all with Facebook, you know what can be done. If somebody says something on Facebook and you can read that, there's a little thing at the bottom that says like. They need another one that says, I hate this like the Dickens. <laughs> Or this is stupid. But they don't have that. They just have a little thing that says like. And you can hit like. And what really irks me is that people will write the dumbest stuff. And it's not that the people are dumb themselves. Because I know intelligent people do this. But they're spouting. They're, they're retelling. Drivel really is what it amounts to. Inaccurate information that they have heard about God and the Bible and the church. And when they do that, nine times out of ten, it's going to get a bunch of likes. That tells me that people are reading that and they're believing that and they're not just reading and believing it, but they're liking it. And that's nothing new. That's nothing new. And so I want to encourage us to think like godly individuals. Don't read things and say, oh, a lot of people like this. A lot of people accept this. The peer pressure, the culture pressure is this is the right thing and so we're going to accept this and we're going to cave into this even though in the back of our minds and sometimes right up in the front of our minds, sometimes right up in the front of our minds beating us in the head, that's not right. We're going to say, oh yeah, but it's popular. So I'll accept it and I'll go along with it. Everybody's doing it. And somehow people think there won't be a, a time as individuals that we'll be called to answer for the things we've liked in this world. Be careful of new information. In Genesis chapter 6, you know what Genesis 6 is about? It's about the flood. Probably everybody in here knows who the only eight people were who were saved in the flood. Who was it? Noah and Mrs. Noah. We'll call her Mrs. Noah because we don't know what her name was. His three sons and their wives. Those, that's it. Eight people. Out of perhaps millions of people who were on the earth at that time. And here's another thing about the millions of people who were on the earth at this time. You remember Methuselah? How old was Methuselah? Anybody remember? Oh, you guys are Bible scholars. Everybody remembers Methuselah, 969 years old. I know, wow, that sounds pretty old. Well, yeah, duh. They didn't have Social Security back then, so everything was okay. Yeah. <laughs> Things were different before the flood. They, they were different in a way that God doesn't explain to us, but they were different in the flood. Adam himself lived over 900 years. When the flood came, the year that the flood came, Noah was 600 years old. Now think about that. People lived to be ages, centuries old. Don't you think? And what God is telling us here in Genesis 6 is that every imagination of the thoughts was evil continually. Violence, it talks about violence I think three different times that the whole world had become so violent, so corrupt when you read through the sixth chapter of Genesis. And I'm wondering to myself, I, I've always thought as I got older, I would get smarter and I would get better and I would grow spiritually. And I'm thinking about these people with those long ages. 
Don't you think that there was some parent somewhere saying to their child, you're 500 years old, when are you going to grow up? <laughs> uh, it sounds funny, but seriously, they live to be that old. You would think at some point they would say, you know, I've been living like this in sin for centuries. I've been violent, I've been evil, and it's, I, I need to change my ways. Apparently nobody thought that except Noah and his family. And sometimes it seems like it's a lot like that today. There's a lot of bad information out there. A lot of people are following that. Perhaps that's why God had Moses write it in the law. This is Exodus chapter 23. Exodus 23 verse 2 says this. You shall not follow the masses in doing evil, nor shall you testify in a dispute so as to turn aside after a multitude in order to pervert justice. Truth, righteousness, justice, well, that sounds like Superman, doesn't it? And the American way. That's what we want the American way to be. We want the American way to be all about truth, justice, and everything that's right. Those are the principles upon which this nation was founded, but, but those principles are being dropped by the wayside to a great extent in our culture today. You shall not follow the masses in doing evil. We know what that's all about. It's peer pressure. We see everybody doing, going off in the wrong direction, thinking wrong things, doing, doing bad thoughts, standing up for things that are not right. It's nothing new. That's why God put it in the law, because he had to wipe the world out with a flood, because people followed the masses to do evil. Israel did the same thing. They did the same thing. Not all of them. If you turn over to Joshua chapter 24, there's that famous text that makes Joshua, in my mind, a real spiritual hero. Joshua chapter 24 Joshua says in verse 15, if it's disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves. What's he saying? Choose as individuals. You make the individual choice what you're going to do. You're going to serve the gods of your fathers, the ones that they served beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you're now living. Joshua says, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'll tell you what me and my house are going to do. What do you say they were going to do? We're going to serve the Lord. And Joshua knew. I'm sure he knew. It, it doesn't say that, but I'm sure he understood. Regardless of what he commanded the people to do, they were all going to do as individuals what they wanted to do. I think what he's trying to do is to get them to think like godly individuals. You make the individual choice to serve Almighty God. We really do or we don't. It's that simple. That's what Joshua preached here. Now about 400 years later, in 1 Samuel chapter 8, Samuel was the last of the judges to rule over Israel. Technically his sons were, but they were lousy guys. Every time I say lousy, I remember that episode of uh, Lucille Ball. Everybody loves Lucy. Is that the way the show was called? When you're up here, you forget what things are called sometimes. But everybody loves Lucy. They went to a speech teacher. He was going to teach him how to, uh, how to speak proper English. And he said, the first thing I want you to learn is there's two words I want you to never use. One of them is swell and the other one's lousy. And they said, okay, what are they? And <laughs> they thought one of the words was swell. And I'll get with you later and explain it. But. Samuel's sons were lousy. They were lousy guys. They were lousy judges because as individuals, they had not chosen God's way. They were following the masses. And so this is what happens in 1 Samuel chapter 8. All the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. Who was it? All the elders of Israel, the wise guys, the, the heads of the families that should have known better, they said to him, Behold, you've grown old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Appoint a king for us to judge us. What's the rest of it? Like the nations. Like the nations. How had these guys, how had Israel gotten to where they were? God had brought them there. They didn't have a king. They didn't need a king. But now that God has brought them to where they were and they were enjoying the benefits of being God's people, they looked around at the nations and they said, Wow, all these nations are governed by kings. We want a king too. 
And so they go to Samuel and they say, we want a king. It says in verse 6, the thing was displeasing in the sight of Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. The Lord said to Samuel, listen to the voice of the people in regard to all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they've rejected me from being king over them. The multitude, the masses, leaving God, and God says, let them go. Let them go. Just like Jesus, when the rich young ruler came to him, said, what good thing can I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, sell everything you got and come follow me. Now a smart man, a wise man, a man who understood the, the, the nature of eternity and that he was talking to the Son of God, he would have said, yes, I'll give up everything in this life and I'll come and follow you because if I do that, I'll have eternal life guaranteed. You're the Son of God and you tell me this. But what did the young man do? Like so many other people, he was enamored with the things of this world. Isn't it hard to give up wealth, to give up comfort, to give up all the things that this world has to offer, to value spiritual things? It can be hard. Is there a payoff? I'll tell you there's a payoff. I have never once... I'm starting to get to be an old codger, but I have never once in my, my time of serving the Lord ever done what the Lord wanted me to do and look back with regret on that. Well, I'm sorry I did what the Lord said there. Every time, every time, every time I follow the Lord, it pays off. You have to think like a godly individual. You can't think like the masses. You can't think like the culture. You can't think like people are telling you to think. You have to think like you know God is teaching and training you to think. In John chapter 9, we're going from the, from the old covenant and the history that's there to the history that God provides for us in the Gospels. In John chapter 9, Jesus saw a man who was blind and he was blind from birth. This man had been blind all his life. We're not told what his age is. But we're told he's a man, old enough to be considered a man, blind from birth. Jesus cured this man of his blindness. He spat on the ground, made mud, put it on the guy's eyes and said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. The man went to the pool of Siloam, he washed his eyes, and he had his sight. And that marvelous miracle that Jesus had done for that man became a spiritual controversy. Look at verse 13. They brought to the Pharisees the man who was formerly blind. And it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. And the Pharisees also were asking him again how he received his sight. And he said to them, he applied clay to my eyes and I washed and I see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees were saying, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. He can heal a guy from blindness who's been blind to birth, birth from birth, but he, he's not from God because he's doing it on the Sabbath day. Now really, if you're thinking right... What better day than the day that God has set aside to give someone back his sight? But that's not the way these guys thought. They were thinking simply and strictly in terms of law. Others were saying, how can a man who's a sinner perform such signs? And there was a division among them, as there always will be when somebody tries to elevate Jesus. When somebody tries to say he really is the Son of God, there's going to be a division. When somebody tries to say the Bible really is the Word of God, there's going to be a division. How can a man who's a sinner perform such signs? There was a, a division among them. So they said to the blind man again, what do you say about him since he opened your eyes? And he said, he's a prophet. The Jews did not believe it of him, that he'd been born blind and received sight until they called the parents of the very one who had received his sight. And questioned them, saying, Is this your son who you say was born blind? Then how does he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son. Boy, those parents were on top of things, weren't they? <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't mean it's it just stay with me. We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but now how he sees we do not know, or who opened his eyes we do not know. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. And that, that makes perfect sense when you see it like that, because after all, who knows where the parents were and, and what they know about the whole situation. But then you read verse 22. 
His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. The Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed him to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. For this reason, his parents said, he's of age, ask him. Now, I'm, I'm not saying this simply to fault or mock these parents. I'm just saying that that's pretty typical. When you know that what you're about to say is not popular, and when you know that what you're about to say, even though it's the absolute truth, might get you in a world of trouble with the people you're saying it to, it might give you pause as to whether or not you'll say it. The question is, should it? Should it give us pause? Or should we lovingly, committedly, devotedly, respectfully and honorably say, this is the truth. I know this is the truth. What's that story we have about the, the emperor's new clothes? Do you remember that story? See if I can tell it briefly. These, uh, these two hooligans, these con men come into town and they say that they can make these clothes and they're the best clothes in the world, but only people who are really wise can see the clothing. And so people come in and they look and, and they don't want to say, oh, I, I can't see them because what's it going to mean if you say you can't see it? It means you're stupid. Oh, y'all, those are beautiful clothes. Eventually, the clothes are given to the king. The, the clothes that don't exist. <laughs> But there's this long line of people saying, oh, yeah, they're beautiful. But if you can't see them, you must be really stupid. So the king's walking down the street in these clothes. And, of course, he's naked. One little boy in the crowd says, ha, ha, look at the king. He's naked. And at that point, everybody says, oh, yeah, he is. How'd that happen? People following a multitude. People following a stupid idea. People following something that's just not the right. It, it, it's not the truth. But people buy it because it has some degree of popularity and you don't want to be thrown out of the synagogue. You don't want to be ostracized. That's what the problem was with these people. You go to chapter 12 and it's the same thing all over again. John chapter 12, Jesus is preaching and he's teaching and people, even leaders are believing him because they're hearing what he's saying. And like Nicodemus, back in chapter 3, Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews, comes to Jesus at night and he says, we know you're from God because of the things that you do. That's what's happening in chapter 12. But look what it says in verse 42. Nevertheless, many, even of the rulers, believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. And then verse 43, here's another telling verse. They loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. Now really that poses a question for us, for you and me. What do we love the most in this world? Do we love God's approval or do we love the approval of men? And it's not just not having the approval of men sometimes. Sometimes it's having the disapproval of men. When people say, you're an idiot. You believe that God spoke everything into existence? You believe this world's only thousands of years old? You don't believe the world's 4.5 billion years old, the universe? How can you not believe that? Well, that's another sermon, but for one thing, science. Real science. Real science and there's the rub. There is such a thing as false science. Paul referred to it as knowledge falsely so called. It's all over the place. What do we love more? The approval of men? Or the approval of God? One last text I want us to go to here in John. Turn over to, to chapter 19. And these guys, and there are others that I could pull out like Moses from Hebrews 11. He, he chose the sufferings of his people rather than the pleasures of sin for a season. Moses was a standout guy. He was the kind of guy who thought as an individual, but as a godly individual. And he followed the godly ways that he knew with his people rather than follow the multitudes of sin. So many others that did that. But, but here in John 19, and I threw that out about Moses just to give you enough time to get to John 19. Everybody there? All right. Verse 38, Jesus has been crucified. 
It says, after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate granted permission, so he came and took away his body. Nicodemus, who first came to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bowed it in linen wrappings with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. And in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had been, yet been laid. Therefore, because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Now think about what these two guys have done. Jesus, the one who was supposed to be the Messiah, is dead. And I, I would think that there would be people thinking, wow, he's dead. Maybe he wasn't the Messiah. Even though Jesus told them over and over and over again, they're going to arrest me. I'm going to be killed. But I'll raise on the third day. They were just human beings, though, like you and me. And they probably thought, some of them, how could he be the Messiah if he's dead? Son of God, crucified? I, I don't see how that could work. But these two guys, Jesus, having been suffered a criminal's death, these two guys come boldly to Pilate and they say, we want the body. In other words, they're not afraid to be connected to Jesus. And Pilate grants him the body. Nicodemus brings a hundred pounds of myrrh and aloes. That was a very costly bundle of stuff. They used it all to anoint the body of Jesus. What were they thinking? I, I don't know. It doesn't really say. I just know what they did. I know what they did. And you know what they did because John wrote it down. They thought like godly individuals. Regardless of what they believed about Jesus now, they showed him love. They showed him respect. They showed him honor. They weren't afraid to go before the officials and say, hey, we're with him. Count us with him. We'd like to have his body. I read about things like this and I, I project myself back. Yeah, if I was there, that's what I'd have been doing. Do you do that kind of thing? You watch movies. Boy, if I was in that movie, I'd do this. You might even talk to the screen sometimes. He's behind the door. Because <laughs> you're projecting yourself into the story. And we do that sometimes. But if I was back there, I think I'd be cowering in a corner like the rest of the apostles were. What happened in the garden? They fled. Why did they flee? I, I'm not exactly sure, but I think it's because things weren't turning out like they thought they would. Peter was ready to fight. Peter was ready to die. He pulled his sword. He attacked Malchus, cut off his ear. Jesus said, put your sword up. And G Peter's saying, wait a minute. That's not the way I wanted this to go down. I'm ready to fight and die for you. But when he found out that wasn't the way it was going to work, they fled. In this world, there's all kinds of lies being told. But this book is truth. If you hold to this book... The same thing's going to happen to you that happened to Jesus. That's what Jesus said. They've called me Beelzebub. What do you think they're going to call you? So the question is, how are we going to think? Are we going to follow the multitude? Or are we going to think like godly individuals? We have a, uh, a concluding tradition for every sermon. We offer the invitation. If you've never become a Christian... We give you an opportunity to do that, and you do that simply by doing the things that Jesus taught. You put your faith in Him. You repent of sin, confess His name, somebody buries you in water. That's the plan of salvation. If you do that, you'll become part of the kingdom, but if you become part of the kingdom, you won't be part of this world anymore. Do you want to be part of the kingdom? Do you want to think like a godly individual? Or do you want to stay part of this world? That's the question. It's out there, and it'll be out there until the Lord comes back. Let's stand and sing.